we're going to be discussing pulmonary care. It tends to be one of our most post-live viewed um, meetings, and I think that's because a lot of folks um, who are diagnosed with lung cancer are like, hmm, I don't have a pulmonologist, or why should I have a pulmonologist, and what does that look like for me, and what might that mean? So um, tonight we're going to be doing a lot of talking about information around pulmonary care, and we really, really, really hope that tonight, you know, you take away from this information what a pulmonologist does, why it's important that a pulmonologist be part of your care team, and what role it is that they play really throughout um, the experience of having been diagnosed with lung cancer. So we've got Dr. Brian Gottkin, who's the medical director of adult pulmonology, director of lung cancer screening and incidental lung nodule screening program at Memorial Cancer Center in South Florida. And, and you guys know that we've had several doctors from Memorial, our friends down there in South Florida, come and talk about different, um, different things pertaining to lung cancer. And we couldn't be more thrilled to have Dr. Gottkin here tonight. And so I think it's, it's important to note that not all pathways to a lung cancer diagnosis necessarily involve a pulmonologist, right? There are different ways to kind of get to that space. And even if you don't come to your own lung cancer diagnosis or if you're at risk, right, what we want everybody to walk away with tonight is why, if you do not, you need a pulmonologist on your team. And it seems, it seems like logical, right? A pulmonologist deals with diseases of the lungs, right? And what is going on with your lungs or sleep problems, whether it's apnea or something like that, right? Um, so why wouldn't they be part of the lung cancer team? So now we can jump in. What is the role of a pulmonologist? Uh, I feel like we play a very important role. Um, as you know, and as most of the people know, the leading cause of lung cancer right now is smoking. So patients tend to have smoking related lung diseases and they have complaints of shortness of breath. So oftentimes somebody will, re will be referred to me with a diagnosis of shortness of breath. And in part of the workup, we can do x-rays and CAT scans that can lead to the diagnosis of uh, lung cancer. So we're sort of the gatekeeper. We get patients referred to us who are symptomatic. And we also get patients who are referred to us with incidental findings. So, you know, as far as the diagnosis of lung cancer, oftentimes it is an incidental finding. Somebody will go to the emergency room with abdominal pain and they'll get a CAT scan of the abdomen and they'll see something at the bottom of the lungs. Or somebody goes for a uh, CAT scan, a coronary scan, looking at heart disease, cholesterol buildup, plaque buildup in the coronary arteries and you catch part of the lungs and you see nodules. And then once you see a nodule, you know, people get very scared about the, about the the terminology of a nodule or a lung mass, and patients will get referred to us. So I think that we are the gatekeeper. We like to see these patients, whether they're symptomatic or not symptomatic. We go through their history with them. We talk about risk factors for lung cancer. We talk about their symptoms, and we review CAT scans and images with them. So a big part of what I do is I sit down in front of a computer I, put up, I pull up the CAT scan, we look at the images together, we talk about the findings, we talk about the differential diagnosis of what we see, and we talk about plans. So a big part of being a pulmonologist is being able to communicate with patients, with other doctors, and it's to problem solve. And I think that uh, our involvement in lung cancer, while it wasn't always seen as important, you know, you always think you need to see the cancer specialist, I, I think that we're sort of the constant throughout the course of lung cancer. And we're there to help if symptoms arise, if complications arise, and we help in symptomatic control and diagnosis and in therapy. I know this doesn't relate to folks who have already been diagnosed with lung cancer, but I do want to touch on screening and then I want to move to IPNs. But Screening for lung cancer has been approved for a decade now, right, give or take. And we're still only seeing, on average, 6 8%, some, in some places up to 11% of the people who currently qualify for lung cancer screening actually utilizing screening. And when I say currently qualify, I'm talking about 16 million, give or take, people in the United States alone. So a very, very small percentage of those people 
who we could potentially find at early stage are not getting screened. And I, and I have my own opinions about this and whatnot, but, but I think you, Dr. Gottkin, are having those conversations with the patients you know are at risk and fit the current qualifying criteria, yes? Correct, and just like the sign behind you that says awareness. You know, it's very important for everybody to be aware uh, of lung cancer screening, of risk factors. And some people are just not aware that lung screening is now approved and it's now recommended. And the recommendations have changed over time to include different ethnic groups and people at more high risk. So right now, the criteria for lung cancer screening would be anybody between the ages of 50 and 80 who have smoked the equivalent of a 20 pack year history. So basically you take the number of packs that you smoke per day and multiply it by the number of years. So if you smoke the pack a day for 20 years, that's a 20 pack history. And as long as you are either actively smoking or have quit within 15 years, you are eligible for screening. So a half a pack a day for 30 years, a pack a day for 20 years, you know, however you wanna do the math, you know, it has to be 20 years, so half back a day for 40 years, sorry. So it's a 20 pack year history and between the ages of 50 to 80 um, and either actively smoke or have quit within 15 years. Beyond 15 years, um, we don't typically screen, uh, although there are still some controversies about who should be screened. Should people who have a family history of lung cancer be screened? Should people who have secondhand exposure be screened? So there's still a little bit of controversy and the guidelines don't really extend to those people. But right now, everybody should be aware, you know, the people who don't have lung cancer, the people who are at high risk should be screened. And screening means finding a population of asymptomatic people, you know, just the high risk, the, the smokers or previous smokers. Yeah, and I think it's important to talk about it and, and at GoTo screening is one of our priorities are increasing the rates of those being screened. and. You mentioned the quit, you know, within the last 15 years and recently within the last year, the American Cancer Society came out with a recommendation to get rid of that part of the guideline, right? And now we're just kind of waiting and go to a signing on to getting the USPSTF, it's a preventative services group out there, right? Um, to sign on to it too, because until USPSTF does, it most likely will not become part of the guidelines. But I think it's important and that, can you imagine how many more people that's even going to open up the, the screening to? And, and in spite of the fact, and as frustrating as it is, I think, for a lot of folks who have been diagnosed with lung cancer and do not have any smoking history, or like, what about me? I'll give a shameless plug to go to Alchemy and Dana-Farber and a study that we're doing right now called Inherit, where we really are taking this deep dive look into whether or not lung cancer is an inherited disease and what we can identify there could help to actually open doors for more people to become screened. So um, there are three different arms to it. If anybody is interested, you do not have to have lung cancer. You can be a family member like myself. I have enrolled um, in the study, given the, the family history, beginning with my great grandfather going on down to my, my mom of folks who have had lung cancer. But I think it's important because who better than someone walking the walk, right, who has been diagnosed with lung cancer than to scream from the mountaintops because there are people that they know that fit the criteria currently, right, right. to encourage them to go and get screened. And it's a low-dose CT scan. And correct me if I'm wrong, but because I know a lot of people are fearful of radiation and the like, but when I fly back and forth to Florida to see you, as I did earlier in the year for our uh, living room re regionally out there, I got an equivalent to the same amount of, of radiation that you would get in a low-dose CT scan just by being on that airplane. Yeah, the amount of radiation in the low-dose screening scan is minimal. So it's not something to be concerned about. Uh, and it's definitely worth the risk of the radiation, which is again, minimal. But another big part of the screening is to continue to screen. So just to get that, that one test is not good enough. You need to do the annual screening or potentially more frequent tests based upon what the initial screening test shows. Okay, and next, and we're just gonna touch on this really quickly. And again, this is for some of you who might be newer to the program and Dr. Gotkin brought up IPNs or incidental pulmonary nodules. So 
you went to the hospital, the emergency room, or to the doctor for something else, and during the workup for that, they found a nodule on your lung. Historically speaking, a lot of those were, I don't want to say lost, I don't know what the correct phrase I may be looking for, but they're not followed up, right? Somebody goes home, they're like, good news, you don't need surgery, nothing's broken, bye-bye, but nobody necessarily talked to you about that nodule and or put an elevated importance on following up about it. And I'm happy to say that the tides are sort of changing in that too, where these IPN um, programs are, are popping up all over, particularly large cancer centers, but even in the community center and, and the importance of following up with those nodules. Yeah, we actually find more lung cancers through incidental scans than through screening scans. Yeah. And it could be anything. You go into the emergency room with chest pain and you get a CAT scan of the chest looking for a pulmonary embolism or, you know, like we said, the abdominal pain or the coronary scan or, or just a, a shoulder x-ray where you catch part of the lung. So, you know, we're definitely doing a lot of scanning in the emergency rooms and our group at Memorial has partnered with the radiologist so that any abnormal finding in the lung will come to our navigator or nurse navigator and we sift through everything we re we review the images and we decide who needs follow-up and we communicate with patients and physicians so that people don't get lost so that if something is found today and they don't know about it because oftentimes somebody will be discharged from the er before the official reading comes on the cat scan and then they're lost to follow up and who knows, you know, a couple of years later, they come back to the emergency room and they have metastatic disease when you could have found it at an earlier stage, which yeah. is very important. Yep, agreed, agreed. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> now we're gonna jump into some diagnostics. We've already talked about the fact that there's many different ways someone might come to find themselves with a nodule, right? In a perfect world, um, you've got a pulmonologist, either you've been screened or a nodule has been detected and things are happening the right way. I want to discuss radiographic findings, right? There's um, a little show and tell. It's called pocket nodules and it's just a tool for you to have a visual reference to what it is we're going to be talking about next, which is do they look characteristically different? So size, location, appearance, and can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. sure. So when we talk about lung nodules, you know, oftentimes we'll, we'll refer to it in the layman's term as uh, we found a spot on your lung. So a spot typically is a nodule. And nodules are like pebbles that by definition are up to three centimeters, let's say. And anything above three centimeters is probably considered more of a lung mass than a lung nodule. So you could find one lung nodule, you could find multiple lung nodules. And there are different characteristics to the lung nodules that make them some more concerning than others. So typically the size of a lung nodule. So you said, I, I don't know if it was now or before, but somebody heard that they had a four millimeter lung nodule and they were very scared. So four millimeter lung nodule in the scheme of things is, is not scary, okay? So we use something called Fleischner criteria to help determine how often people should get scanned based upon the finding of a lung nodule. So we don't typically start getting worried or following things until they are six millimeters in size. So anything under six millimeters in a low risk patient, statistics have shown that it's unlikely to be a cancer. So size matters when it comes to lung nodules. So anything above six millimeters is where we start. So six to eight, and then above eight millimeters gets concerning. As far as where in the lungs, so upper lobes uh, are a little bit more concerning than the lower lobes. So the right lung has three lobes, right upper, right middle, and right lower, and the left has the left upper and the left lower. So anything in the upper lobes is, con is more concerning than in the lower lobes. In between the different parts of the lungs, the upper, middle, and lowers, there's something called the fissure that separates the different parts of the lungs. And, and the nodule near the fissure is also considered a little bit um, less worrisome. It's thought to be more related to a lymph node. So size, location, characteristics, so your little display. So anything that is what we call spiculated or has little spikes on it or is not smooth is a little bit more concerning than something that's round and smooth. Um, anything that's calcified or like looks like a little pebble is also less concerning. So 
not all lung nodules are going to turn into cancers. They're like we're talking about now, there are certain characteristics that make them more worrisome. So when you hear you have a lung nodule, most lung nodules are not cancer. All right. So depending upon what part of the country you live in, a lung nodule may be a sign of a fungal infection. If you're like in the Midwest, there's different endemic funguses like coccidiomycosis and blastomycosis that come up as lung nodules. It could be other kinds of infections like uh, tuberculosis. Um, we have these little granulomas, uh, which are inflammatory reactions in the lungs. So infections could be it. You can have a benign tumor. So you can have a calcified mass, what we call a hamartoma, or you can have a lipoma, a fatty tumor. So there are some benign lung nodules. Um, and then there's also nodules related to inflammatory diseases. You could get rheumatoid lung nodules. You can have sarcoid lung nodules. So there are a lot of benign findings. It's the worrisome ones. It's the upper lobe, larger spiculated nodules that we are more concerned about for cancer and that we're more likely to intervene or follow more closely. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I just want to do a check and make sure that nobody's got. I just wanted to know what there's the RADS 1 and 2 and the RADS 3 and 4, and I see that the nodules are larger on that, but what does the RADS stand for? So the RADS is just a, a, a system that tells us how quickly we need to intervene or how uh, likely they are related to lung cancer. So RADS 1 and 2 are considered a very low likelihood for lung cancers. The, it's the RADS 3 and 4 that we have to worry more about. It's the RADS 4 that um, we would intervene. And, it, and it's based upon size, basically, and growth. So if something suspicious is found on a scan, yeah, and it's not necessarily, well, I guess there's two roads to go, right? Something suspicious that's not too suspicious yet, I guess, for, you know, to keep it simple versus something that, okay, next step. So sometimes there's a watch and wait, maybe a rescan right. protocol, but sometimes you go to biopsy. So what does that look like for someone who's moving into the biopsy realm? So once we have a lung nodule and once we determine the likelihood of cancer, there's a couple different routes that we can go. We could do what's called a PET scan. So a PET scan is looking for hypermetabolic activity. Basically, we're injecting uh, radioactive uh, sugar water into somebody. And the thought is that cancer sort of eat up this sugar water and they light up. So things that light up on PET scans are worrisome for lung cancer. Um, so we may want to intervene. So anything that typically grows, we may want to intervene. So, and when I talk about intervening, that could be anywhere from a biopsy to even a resection. So there's different ways to biopsy a lung nodule and we do it based upon size and location. So we used to mostly do CT guided lung biopsies. I would say that's what we used to, that's mainly what we used to do, where you go to the CAT scan table, you already know that you have a lung nodule that's worrisome, and they will either lay you down on your stomach or on your back, depending upon their ease to get to it. And the radiologist will use the CAT scanner and he'll put a needle in through your chest or in through your back into the spot in the lung to take a piece of tissue. These are usually well tolerated. There are potential complications such as bleeding um, or a collapse of the lung. So, you know, we think of the lung sort of as a sponge and you're putting a needle or a balloon and you're putting a needle into a balloon and it can pop. Uh, more recently, uh, we've done what's called navigational bronchoscopy. We've always had bronchoscopy, but bronchoscopy originally was done with use of just plain chest x-rays, images of chest x-rays. But now we have like this GPS system where it's a lot more defined. So we, we map out where the lung nodule is before we do the bronchoscopy. Um, and then we use this GPS system through a bronchoscope, uh, which is usually either insert, inserted into your nose or through your mouth. And we use biopsies, uh, biopsy forceps that are directed with the GPS system directly to the lung nodule uh, to take a biopsy that way. And there's theoretically less risk for pneumothorax doing it that way. Um, so those are the typical ways that we biopsy lung nodules. Sometimes uh, on CAT scans, not only will we see a lung nodule, but we'll also see some enlarged lymph nodes. And when we see an enlarged lymph node, 
we could do what's called an endobronchial ultrasound. So what we do is we put an, ultra, uh, an ultrasound instrument down with the bronchoscope, find the lymph node, and then take a little needle, go into the lymph node and take tissue. So the benefit of that is not only in diagnosis, but it's also in staging, and there's also less risk for pneumothorax. So one of the coolest things I remember when navigational bronchoscopies first sort of entered the scene and I had the benefit of, with the permission of the patient, of course, with being in the operatory or whatever the room is that this was being done and to watch this procedure happen, and it's so incredibly different, and especially when I think about um, the sort of, you know, in advent or, or discovery of biomarkers, it became even more important so you could get more tissue, good quality tissue, but you could also, to Dr. Gutton's earlier comment, you could pull from what you assume to be like a primary lesion, but also go pull from lymph nodes like all in one setting. So there wasn't this constant like need for like repeat biopsies and it's, it's important for staging. Can you talk a little bit about why it's important for staging to know exactly what it is we're looking at? Sure. So staging will determine your therapy. So typically for stage one and two lung cancers, surgery is the best option, right? That's what we do. Uh, for some threes, uh, we'll also do surgery. And for fours, it's usually chemotherapy, radiation. So staging is important to determine the therapy. Um, and staging is based upon spread of tumor. So is it localized? Is it a you know two centimeter solitary lung nodule that turns out to be cancer? Is it, or, or is it a six centimeter lung mass that has involvement of the lymph nodes within your chest, um, which would make it a different stage. So you go from like a stage one to a stage three, or do you have distant metastatic disease? Has it involved your liver, your brain, your bones? So the staging is important for therapeutic and for prognostic implications. To reiterate biomarker testing, <laughs> because it's again, another one of GoTo's goals is to increase the rates of those um, appropriately tested, not only at diagnosis, but also at progression. And so I can't express enough how important it is to get good quality tissue that can be sent off for this type of testing, because it too right. determines what type of therapy you may or may not qualify for. So, and, that, and that's another place where the pulmonologist could come into comes into play because we are typically the ones who are doing the diagnostic procedures. And when we get tissue, it's important for the pulmonologist to make sure that we send the tissue for biomarkers because when the person sees the oncologist, it's it will delay therapy if they have to send off um, the tissue. So at the time of the diagnosis, when we're doing the procedure, when we're ordering the, the biopsy, uh, we asked the pathologist to send it off for different biomarkers such as, you know, EGFR or KRAS or ALK. So that also will help guide therapy because, like I've said earlier, at one point, lung cancer was a deadly disease. People were dying quickly with it. But now we've become so specialized in that once we get the biomarker, we direct therapy directly toward those mutations and, and survival so much better. Yeah even in later stages of disease. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think, you know, being where, where I am, where the folks in the room are here on the peninsula in Northern California, we have access, right? Access is not an issue here to doctors like you who are providing quality of care to the patients that walk through your door, but that's not always the case. And I think, this is where it becomes incumbent on the person going through this and their caregivers, if God willing, they have them to advocate for themselves, to learn as much as they can so that they can go back and have these informed conversations and, and quite frankly, make demands, <laughs> right? Like as, as a, a person who is facing a potential diagnosis of lung cancer, you have the right to these things. So. Um, anyway, I hope that programming like this is, is helpful for those of you who, who may not have access. I hear too many horror stories about either delayed diagnosis or inappropriate staging or 
or, or, or. I mean, you, it, it goes right on down the line. And um, I just hope that, that those folks find benefit in having conversations like this with you. So now we fast forward and someone has in fact been diagnosed. What role do you play once someone is diagnosed with lung cancer? So, you know, once someone's diagnosed with lung cancer, I act as the go-between in a sense. So at my institution, we have a tumor board every Monday morning. And so we present the case and it's a multidisciplinary approach to each patient. So the patient is presented, the case is presented, uh, at this conference, we have uh, thoracic surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, radiologists, and pathologists. And we review the case. We talk about the case. And so it's my role to sort of present the case, um, to have staged the case, and to talk about their surgical appropriateness. Because uh, not everybody who is, by definition, a surgical candidate based upon the tumor is somebody that you want to send for surgery, right? So because it is mostly a smoking related disease and people have emphysema, there are people who just can't undergo surgery. So it's, it's my role to help the patient decide whether or not they're good for surgery, whether they can hand, handle surgery, because you don't want to make somebody who is a functional active person, you know, oxygen dependent or, or crippled by undergoing removal of part of your lung. So what we do is we get them ready for surgery or we get them ready for whatever therapy they're gonna go for. And we order pulmonary function tests to measure their lung function, their capability of undergoing surgery. And in those borderline patients, we can order other kinds of testing to see whether or not they can qualify for surgery, uh, such as exercise testing or other kind of radiographic studies to show how much lung function will be left after surgery. So. I look at my role as sort of the mediator. I introduce the patient to the different modality, to the different uh, specialties. I get them potentially ready for surgery. I help them make the decision whether surgery is appropriate for them or do we just go straight to like a stereotactic radiation, cyber knife therapy, where we direct therapy solely at the, the nodule. Uh, in those localized cases, I introduce them to the medical oncologist um, and, and I walk them through their therapy. I, you know, I'm there at the beginning, I'm there during, and I'm there throughout their care because oftentimes patients do get side effects, whether it's from surgery, you know, they get, they, they're short of breath after surgery or their oxygen levels a little bit low after surgery or they're wheezing after surgery. So I help with the medications, I help arrange oxygen or with radiation, same thing. You can get uh, an inflammation within the lungs. You can get what's called a radiation pneumonitis or you you can get some resultant pulmonary fibrosis as a result of radiation. Um, so again, I help them with the, the treatment for the radiation pneumonitis. I help them with the oxygen. I, I basically, you know, I help them get through it. I treat them with medications and I encourage exercise and get them enrolled in pulmonary rehab if that's something that's appropriate for each person. So I've developed a relationship with the patient before. I've given them the diagnosis. I guide them through therapy and I help with uh, potential side effects or, or bumps in the road. So stepping back, like let's start with the surgical patient and you talked a little bit about this, but walk us through what like prehabilitation for surgery might look like for the patient. When anybody goes for surgical resection, curative resection, we always do pulmonary function tests to make sure that they have enough lung function after surgery so that again they're not crippled so we look at their ability to blow out air in one second um, and their post uh, predicted ability we look at what's called the diffusion capacity to make sure that there's enough lung capacity to undergo surgery so along with the surgeon we make the decision is this patient capable of undergoing surgery what's what's their status as far as ability to exercise and walk we want to send the appropriate person to surgery just because they meet criteria to sur for surgery doesn't mean everybody should go for surgery. So we start people on inhalers, the ones who have underlying COPD, or we start people, we give people prednisone right before surgery so that when they undergo surgery, they don't get all, their lungs don't get what we call bronchospastic or very tight and wheezing. So we get them ready for surgery with medications, with exercise, and then once they're ready, you know, they go and then we see them postoperatively and, and we help in that sense too. So for the folks who 
who maybe have some underlying COPD, emphysema, something like that. Surgery alone without COPD or, or, or some other type of lung disease compromises your lung function, especially if you've had a lobectomy or a pneumonectomy where they remove the whole side, right? And then you add a COPD sort of on top of that. And I think, again, this points back to the importance of having a doctor who specializes in the lung paying attention to you and your care because there are supportive, supportive therapies that can help you kind of get, get through, I guess. Optimize, you, uh, optimize sure. yeah. Optimize the function that you may or may not have left. And I know this was a thing for Bonnie, my mom, when she was diagnosed because nobody really talked to her about that sort of in the beginning about that, what that was going to look like. And, and she also had um, a, a, a radiation therapy and that really messed up her airway. So because of the scar tissue, her, her airway had also shrunk or narrowed, right? So getting that O2 to sort of from the outside in and then back out was a real struggle for her. So how do you manage sort of that airway issue as well? Is there other things that we can do to help those people? Yeah, after someone's received radiation and if they do have inflammation, whether it's in their lungs or in their esophagus or in their throat, oftentimes we can uh, put somebody on steroids for a period of time to get rid of the inflammatory response uh, and get them through the acute process um, and get them feeling better again. Sometimes, you know, there's sometimes you can just have very bad radiation and you can get some stenosis and you can you, you may need some stenting uh, either in the airways or in other parts. So there are things that you know we can do uh, to help diagnose and to help treat. You know, and you talk to the the radiation oncologist, and you know, you just make everybody aware of what their lung function is like. And you know, uh, um, it's good for me because I work with good physicians, and everybody's on the same boat, and we all talk, and we all know about the patient, and talk about the potential side effects of each one of our therapies. So I think again, communication amongst the doctors is important, so that everybody knows uh, what to expect, and then to communicate with the patient. Yeah, and I think that's an important part of what you've been saying since the beginning, too, is this multidisciplinary approach, right? So it's not any one doctor working in a silo on any one right. thing, but it's all of your healthcare providers talking together and collectively coming up with the best decision for you in any given moment. Also, so, I just want to say the oh. smoking cessation, you know, again, I, and not, not everybody smokes or is actively smoking, but smoking cessation is another thing that we talk about uh, as a pulmonologist with the patient, especially before somebody goes for surgery. Um, talk about therapies, uh, you know, medications and psychotherapy, you know, yeah. just talking to people, different yeah. quick groups. I had a lobectomy 15 and a half years ago. I'm very fortunate it was found early because I entered a study at the time. But afterwards, and I began part of this uh, foundation and volunteering and so forth, Bonnie told me to definitely go to a pulmonologist. And when I went, not only did they continue with the pulmonary function test, but they had a separate test that tested your breathing capability when you're flying and for the altitude. They don't have that anymore. And why isn't this part of what's done with the pulmonologist? Because I found out I needed to travel with a POC. Um, luckily, I've never really needed to use it, but I never would have known it. And so why isn't that more routine? So we do do it. Some places have stopped doing it. It's probably about reimbursement. So what she's talking about is a high altitude stim simulation test. So what we would do is we would simulate what would happen if you were up in an airplane. Uh, we would give somebody uh, lower amounts of oxygen. So the room air is 21%. So we would go down and simulate what would happen at high altitudes. And in those patients who desaturate during the high altitude simulation test, uh, we would provide them with a POC or portable oxygen concentrator. And that's something that 
you have to you know speak to each airline about because they have specific rules but we write letters we arrange for people that have portable oxygen concentrators um, so I don't know why it's not being done as much as it did in the past. We've been substituting high altitude simulation tests for exercise pulse oximetries. So we get people up and walking around. And uh, if we don't have access to a high altitude to a high altitude simulation test, we see if somebody's oxygen level goes down as they ambulate. And if it goes down with the ambulation, again, we can order a portable oxygen concentrator. If it doesn't go down with the ambulation, um, I guess the thought is, is that you're less likely to desaturate even at high altitudes, because if you're stressing yourself and exercising, using your muscles and desaturations don't go down, then the chances of it getting seriously low at a high altitude are less. But I, I still think a high altitude simulation test would be, it, it is a good test. And if it's available where you are, it's something uh, I would recommend uh, people who have underlying lung disease or have had previous surgeries undergo before they fought. Just one other thing about that. When I uh, found out I needed to travel with that, Medicare, or no insurance, would pay for it because I didn't need it on the ground. I only needed it in the air. So I don't know if that's changed because it's been about 10 years. I used to borrow Bonnie's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cover and then I finally yeah. bought myself one, but they're not cheap. They're not cheap, they and coverage and reimbursement is definitely an issue, I think, with some of this. It's interesting because I didn't know that it was routinely not being offered. What I do know is that when you're traveling in an airplane, they pressurize the cabin at around 8,000 feet. And what I also know, and you, you Dr. Gott, can use the word ambulatory. So if you're moving around and your, ox your oxygen saturations don't drop at a you know, normal sea level where we are right now, um, what they're saying is for some, that's suffice. But I know firsthand with Bonnie in particular, <laughs> um, she's fine moving around here, going to the grocery store, going out to lunch, doing her own thing. But we've got a, uh, she and uh, my stepdad have a cabin up in Tahoe, and we're at about 6,800 feet. She can't walk a flight of stairs there. So, I mean, I think it's, it's something that folks definitely need to think about. She does travel with a POC. She's typically okay if it's an hour flight, like if she's flying here from Southern to California. She's, she's still got it with her, but she, she fights it. But if it's a cross-country flight, she, she has to wear it because her sats tank. In order to qualify for oxygen, you do have to have saturations of 88% or less. Mm -hmm. So even at high altitude, people can feel short of breath and not be hypoxic, not yeah. have low oxygen levels. So for Medicare and for most insurances, it's 88% or less at rest or with ambulation. Yeah. Um, and then with the high altitude simulation test, you know, I don't know the reimbursements now for it, but it can be expensive. It's probably about $3,000 to buy a POC. Yeah, I think you can rent them too. But I think one little fun fact and um, resource I'm going to give everyone who's watching is through like your local REI or I'm sure Amazon, you can buy your own personal pulse oximeter. Um, you can just so go to Walgreens. Can, yeah, Wal does Walgreens have them too? Okay, so yeah. there you go. On your way home tonight, stop at Walgreens. Between 30 and, four, 30 and $40. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Um, and so... My mom does use that frequently, not just up in Tahoe, but here, and she do, she drops below 80. Like, it's not great. So it's it's actually quite terrifying. So I highly, highly recommend um, for those of you who might struggle with shortness of breath in particular, but anyone really diagnosed with lung cancer going through treatment or having had surgery to get yourself a personal pulse ox level. And I guess since we're on the subject of oxygen, like setting out setting aside travel and altitude, Sometimes people need oxygen, they just need it. How is that determined? I'm assuming it's their pulse oxygenation and all of that too. Are there other things yeah, so that you, factor into that? You know, so you can, you can do it by oximetry. So again, a saturation of 88% or less, either at rest or with exertion or with sleep. You know, sometimes we do overnight oximetries and people who desaturate during sleep who don't have sleep apnea will prescribe oxygen during sleep. Another way to do it is uh, through a blood gas. Uh, which is a stick in the wrist. And what you do is you look at the PO2. And if the oxygen is, is 55 millimeters of mercury 
or less, and they have some pulmonary hypertension, uh, they'll qualify. So it's either an exercise deximetry or a blood gas and an echocardiogram. Great. I mean, the final question I have for you is, what, what, is, what is your greatest hope that people take away from having this conversation? Like, what, what do you hope they get out of it? I mean, I, I would hope that they would just see their pulmonologist on a regular basis, make sure that they're uh, with the pulmonologist throughout the whole course, because the lady who had her surgery 15 years ago may not see the medical oncologist anymore, a thoracic surgeon, because she's passed her five or six years that they see her. But a pulmonologist will stay with her throughout and people get short of breath as they get older. Uh, people require oxygen. People require medications. So I would just encourage people to continue with uh, a pulmonologist from the beginning throughout the entire course because we're, we've developed relationships. We are problem solvers. We are communicators. Uh, and I think that uh, we're a good resource um, to go in the group with the uh, other lung cancer specialists. Agree. Well, I just want to reiterate what Dr. Gottkin said about a pulmonologist, pulmonologist throughout your care. There's a lot of folks who may have had at one time or another and may in the future, who knows, a, a, a radiation oncologist or a medic, you know, medical oncologist or a thoracic surgeon or a pathologist or all the other folks that are part of this multidisciplinary team care for you, but the one person who can and should stay consistent throughout is your pulmonologist. You might not need your rad onc, um, you know, in the moment, but um, your pulmonologist thing. And every, it's, so, it's so interesting to me, and I know it's the psychosomatic, but every time somebody says shortness of breath, I take a deep breath. It's like the craziest <laughs> thing. I notice my body doing it every time it comes, I'm like, <sighs> right? Um, because, I mean, breathing, am I right? <laughs> yeah, so huge, huge thank you. Brian, Dr. Gotkin, for coming out and talking to us tonight and staying up You're late out you. there um, on the East Coast. We, we can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Um, I do want to give a shout out. Michelle's been working really hard for those that are interested, which is a text to remind. I know that go to, you know, we'll send out a reminder maybe on social media somewhere. Michelle does her best to make sure that those emails get out to remind people. But sometimes people aren't looking at their emails that day. So anyone who is interested um, and signing up for a text room might, I promise you we're not texting you about anything else. You'll get a text. I don't know, Michelle, if it's day of, maybe, is it day, it's, you got it today? Okay, so it's day of, it's one text. If you all of a sudden you decide you hate that one text one day a month, you can opt out and not do it. But I think it will be helpful for a lot of people to be like, oh shoot, it is the third, you know, t t Tuesday of the month. So again, you have to opt in. Um, by doing this, but you can opt out at any time if anybody um, is interested in doing that. A huge, huge thank you again to Dr. Gotkin for chiming in or signing in, sorry, from South Florida. I hope you got some dinner before this whole thing started. Um, and um, we can't thank you enough. It's been an absolute pleasure to all of you here in the room, those of you watching live, those of you who will come back and watch post live. Thank you, thank you, thank you. To Onyx and Ash who will pull together this meeting um, and create a beautiful video for your post live viewing pleasure. Um, the entire GoTo team for all the support that they not only give to, um, to, to myself and to um, the patient support services team, but to all of you out there at risk and living with lung cancer. I would be remiss in not thanking our supporters Amgen, AstraZeneca, Bayer, Boehringer, Ingelheim, Bristol Myers Squibb, Daichi Sankyo, Isai Foundation Medicine. Genentech, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Marathi Therapeutics, Novartis, Novacure, Regeneron, Sanofi, and Takeda Oncology. Thank you all so much for continuing to support this, this really important programming that we've been doing for goodness since like 2009. So um, thanks everybody and we will see you next month. So I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're